It is good to be here with you once again. Thank you for joining us. Those of you online, I'm glad you're here as well. And hopefully one of these weeks in the near future, you can join us in person. As that video mentioned, we are in a series, What Does the Bible Say About Politics? And it'd be hard to talk politics if we didn't talk law and order. Anybody excited for that idea? Right, like in our culture today, those words are used quite a bit, and sometimes, if not those words, other words, but the issue of the law comes up every time an election cycle comes around. And it's not just one party or the other party. Both parties historically have focused on the role of the law in their campaigning and in their election process. You have some who say we need to be tougher on crime and others who say we're too tough on crime and some who want to legalize things and some who want to make some things illegal and and all around, across the board, when it comes to elections, we get stuck saying, what is good about the law? Like, which side do we side with? How do we make decisions and know what's best? Now, in our culture right now that's highly polarized and politicized, to talk about the law can often evoke a lot of uh, really visceral emotions. For some in our community, it gives you a picture of police officers who are put in jeopardy trying to protect and serve. For some, it gives you a picture of those who want to come against and tear down and maybe get rid of the very law that we have guiding this country. But for others, the police aren't these heroes who are in danger, but talking about the law and law enforcement can cause us to see places where perhaps the system isn't functioning the way it should. And and perhaps there are some in our community who are hurting at the hands of the law. What do we do with these mixed emotions? Well, I want to share with you one place I think every one of us feels exactly the same about when it comes to the law. You know that panic, the heart attack that happens every time you see this in your mirror, right? We all feel the same about this right here. It doesn't matter if you're obeying the law or not. When you see those red and blue lights flashing behind you, Immediately you check, was I speeding? My seatbelt's on, my phone's in my pocket. Oh no, did I use a blinker? What did I do wrong? Right? And maybe if you're lucky, he just speeds right past you and you have a moment to breathe. And maybe if you're not lucky, it's you that he's pulling over. Probably for something you did, maybe for something you didn't. I don't know if you're like me, but when this happens to me, and I'm the one being pulled over, I'm like frozen and paranoid until they walk up. I I think I've got everything in my my car. Thankfully, my wife is organized, so I think everything's up to date. Did I forget anything? There's no reason it would have been taken out, right? And this panic wells up inside of me, even though I'm generally pretty good at following the law. Until I cross the street from over there to over here, and I jaywalk, because who wants to walk down to the, the crosswalk down there, right? Or until the person in front of me is going 60, and the speed limit's 60, so they really should be going closer to 72. What are they thinking, right? What do we do with the law? You see, in our culture that politicizes it and polarizes it, oftentimes we talk about the law as something we need to change or uphold or enforce, but we never take time to say, what's the purpose of the law? Why is it even there? Now, when we talk about law and order, I have to begin with where this comes from. And so if you are familiar with anything I've ever preached or with the Bible, you will know that I often go back to this place as the place we need to start. The beginning in Genesis 1 and 2. You see, in the beginning, God created everything. Everything. It was good. And there, even in the beginning, before sin entered in, Law and order came in. In fact, if you read the story, God creates all of the world, and then out of that world, he does something special. He creates, in the midst of it, a garden. 
purpose for a garden is to have a place that is orderly and neat, that takes the wild chaos and the craziness of the world and tames it to be something beautiful and structured and put together. God created this very world when everything was good to have order within it, not to be chaotic, not to be crazy, not to be wild and untamed, but to have a place safe where peace abounds. That's what they had there in the garden. Even the animals there in the garden were safe. And I can't imagine what it's like to live in a world where like tigers and bears are totally safe. But that'd be really cool. In some capacity, all of their power, all of their might, everything they're capable of doing. And yet there's no fear of harm. This is the way God created things. Now, now we know that God being a God of order and a God of law, he creates for us rules that function or that determine how the world functions. Like you guys know some of these things, like natural law. Natural law, if you're not familiar with that term, is just the way things are, whether you like it or not. So I'll give you a few examples. The law of gravity, it just is. You can try to defy it. You can try to ignore it. You can try to say, I don't like that law, but it's going to bring you down no matter what. All right? Or other things that we just know in nature. Even in our culture today, where we have a whole lot of differing opinions and perspectives about uh, tough issues like sexuality, we know, even in this culture today, that while love may be love, Two women need at least a man in some capacity to have a child. And two men need a woman in some capacity to have a child. Even in this culture today where we define things differently than they did at one point, where we try to bend the rules, there are just some things that don't work. You won't have a baby on your own. You won't have a baby with somebody of the same sex. Naturally. So natural laws, things that just simply are, whether we like them or not. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says this. It says, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now, to understand where he's going in Romans, Romans, he's, Paul is spelling out the foundation of our faith, what we believe about God. And if you've ever read this book, you'll know the next like six or seven chapters are all about the law. What is the law? What does it do? What impact does it make on us? He begins by saying, every one of us, from just the way the world is made, knows who God is. And maybe you've experienced this. We live here close enough to be in the Smokies in a very short drive. Anybody enjoy just going and getting lost in the woods for a day or a few days? You have that moment when you're out in the woods, when you're looking at the beautiful scenery where it just takes your breath away. You're filled with awe and wonder. And like, wow. We see God's beauty and his invisible attributes everywhere around us in this world. And what Paul is beginning to spell out here is that not a single one of us have an excuse to not know God because God's made himself known in the very fabric of creation. God's law, the way things simply are, is natural. What we'll see here in a little bit is it's now unnatural for you and me. So we'll get there. So the first thing about the law is the law is natural. But then there's a second type of law, a revealed law, a law that comes from somebody showing you something you didn't know. And all of scripture is filled with natural law, things that just are, and revealed law, things that are because they've been made known to you. For example, the speed limit. Few of us just know the speed limit, and even fewer of us just go the speed limit. Until that police officer turns on his lights and reveals to us that we were breaking the law. That law comes in and shows us where we've done something wrong. 
When you read the Old Testament and and all the laws of God, these were revealed things. God said, don't do this, or this isn't good. Most of us naturally probably know that it's not good to cheat on your spouse. It's not good to abuse your spouse. It's not good to kill somebody because you're mad at them. Like, we probably know that, right? But where do we draw the line? What is good and bad? How far can we stretch it? How far can we go? How close can we get to crossing the line? This is where the revealed law shows us what the actual boundary is and the actual place of this is good and this is not. Then there's a third kind of law, the created law. Before we get to that, I almost forgot I should share some more scripture. So we'll go, this revealed law, Romans chapter 3, we'll go a couple verses later, and we'll begin in verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, as Paul is writing about the law and how we all know, and none of us have an excuse, and he's talking about how no one is able to be good on their own. So it says, what then, are we Jews any better off? See, he's making this argument, the law was given, it was revealed to them. And because it was revealed to them, they actually had a special standing, a special place. And yet, are they any better at keeping the law? Well, no, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Do you like hearing those words? See, I think in our sinful state, many of us want to justify and say, I'm pretty good. I'm better than that person, for sure. We want to create all of these rules that that point to how good we are. And yet, Paul says, look, if we have the law, which reveals to us our sin... We know that not a single one of us is righteous. Not a single one of us is capable of doing good. In fact, he continues in a little bit. Verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You see, the more we learn what is supposed to be versus what is, the more we realize what we're doing isn't working. The more we know what we should live up to, the expectations and standards, the law that God has made, the more I fail. Now what? So we have the natural law that just is, the revealed law that is given oftentimes for a specific people in a specific context. And then we have this third category of law, the created law. And these would be things that are man-made that God doesn't really care about. It doesn't matter. Do you know God doesn't care about some things? In the political climate we live in, we try to make every issue the most important issue to God. But it's not that way. God doesn't care if the speed limit is 60 or 65. What he cares about is justice and peace and life. What he cares about is sinners like me being made right or righteous. So this created law, these are laws that have nothing to do with the way things simply are. They have nothing to do with what God said should be. Instead, they're just attempts to help us create order in this world. Attempts to help us understand life as a community together. And there's a lot of created laws. Like, you have to wear shoes when you go into restaurants. Well, that seems silly, but maybe not, right? Like, if you're barefoot, maybe you're bringing a lot more disease. I don't know. I feel like I have just as much disease when I have shoes on as when I don't. I'm not sure. But we have laws that God doesn't really care about because they're just for the sake of creating consistency and a safe place and a place of peace and a place of justice. Now, some people really don't like the government, and if you're here today and you don't like the government, you don't trust the government, that's okay. You don't have to like them. You don't have to trust them. But unfortunately, if the government passes laws, those laws have an implication on your life. 
And so if you think the government is getting ready to make laws that are really bad, you should do something about it. And if they make laws that you think are really good, you should do something about that as well. Now, we will talk in a few weeks, actually, about what do we do when the laws of the land are are really evil or really bad or unjust? Because there is a time and a place when we have to do something. But in our political climate today, especially within the church, we often think that every time is the time we have to do something. Every time I'm offended, every time I perceive an injustice, every time I don't like the law, every time it inconveniences me because I got a speeding ticket, whatever it is, we feel justified in complaining about that law. But most of the time, according to Scripture, what we'll get to in a few weeks is that we should just submit to the law. But we'll get there. So we have these different ways the law comes to us. Either it just is in the fabric of creation, or God in his, his divine plan revealed it to his people for a reason, for a season, for a purpose. And we have these laws that are created just by man to help us know how to live together. So what's the function of these laws? Like if we have all of these laws and they're given to us in different ways, what should they be doing? I'm going to give you three ways today that the law is supposed to function. This applies both to God's law, what we see in Scripture, but also to the law of man, how the government around us should function. If you remember last week, we talked about two different kingdoms. The kingdom of God, which deals primarily with grace and peace and forgiveness, and the kingdom of man, which deals with how we live in this world. Together, it's one people. And these two different kingdoms, they exist side by side, but often an intention. The things God says are not the way the world looks. The things God does are not what we experience. And so we have to live in both kingdoms simultaneously. So these functions of the law apply to both just the same. So the first function is this of governing. The law should give us government to help lead us as a people in the right direction. Now, we can vary and differ in opinion. We can say there should be small government or big government or almost no government. We can vary on how much government should exist. That's okay. But the law should help us govern life together. Let me give you a really practical example. If you're driving down the road and they place curbs on the side of the road, the purpose of those curbs is to help tell you where you should be and where you should not be, right? If you go over the curb, there's a good chance you're going to crash into something or into someone and cause pain and harm. Don't go over that curb. But of course, we live in Tennessee where curbs don't exist and there aren't our shoulders and you're just going to drop off to your death anyway. So let me give you a different example. If the governing law is a curb giving boundaries, it's like a railing around a cliff. The railing is not placed there to limit your life and hold you back from enjoying life. The railing around the cliff is not to constrain you so you can't do the things you want to do. It's to give you a very clear boundary. On the other side of this railing, it will hurt. Okay? Outside of this safety, life might not go well for you. That's one of the functions of the government. You see, if you look at this cliff and the railing, if you stand within the law, within the government, within the railing, and you look out, you get to see all the beauty and all the majesty and all the awe that you want to experience without the risk of falling to your death or being pushed. Depends on who you're with, right? The railing helps to determine what's good for you. This functions with our government too. The laws that the government makes should provide boundaries that say outside of this, it's not good. So for example, the government can pass laws that say it's not good for children to be engaged with sex with adults. That's a bad place for our society to be. Those boundaries help curb and they shape what is healthy and what is not. 
This isn't a moral issue necessarily. This is what's good for society. Now, there's a lot of different issues where we could differ on where the boundary should be. Maybe if you're somebody who doesn't like heights, you would prefer that railing to be three feet back from the ledge, and you could still enjoy it just the same. Maybe if you're somebody who really wants the thrill of experiencing all that life has to offer, you wish there was a glass walkway with just a tiny glass railing so you could feel like you're floating and flying. We can differ on where that boundary should be, but it should be there. The first function is that of governing, to curb what's safe and not safe. See, if you remember last week, the kingdom of this world exists for the purpose of striving for justice, promoting justice, and preserving peace. So anything that's going to be unjust, this world should say, you can't do that. So for example, if you think everybody with long hair doesn't deserve to drive on the road because you can't trust those long-haired hippies, right? That really feels like an injustice, a discrimination against people for no reason. Now, if there's proof that every long-haired person doesn't know how to drive, well, then maybe that'd be a different story. But we're not going to find proof of that. So if the kingdom of this world is for justice and peace, the laws governing and giving boundaries should be laws that establish justice or maintain peace. This next one, this second function, is that of justifying if you remember, I've talked about justifying as being made right with God. So when we read God's law here in Scripture, the things God says, the revealed law, but even the natural, this is just the way it is. It's to help us see our need for God, to justify us before God. As Paul writes, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of of sin. The law functions to show us just how broken we are, like a mirror. Right? We look in a mirror and we see all of our imperfections. We look in a mirror and we see that receding hairline we wish we could fix or cover up. We see those pimples that won't go away. We see the things about us we don't quite love. And this isn't just vain and, and empty. You can look in the mirror and see the hurt and the pain and the loneliness you're feeling. So what do I do with all of this? A mirror reveals to us what's actually there. And the law does the same. See, the law shows us just how much you and I are broken. In fact, the more you and I disagree, the more need there is for law. I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was talking about, it was actually one of the founders of Netflix talking about some of the rules that guide their company. You know, Netflix is kind of a big company that you would think have a lot of rules to guide them. And one of the rules is we try to make as few rules as possible. We just ask our people to ask this one question. What's best for Netflix? If you can answer that question and do the thing you're setting out to do, do it. If not, don't do that. And he gave a really simple example. He said, you know, some big companies, I set all these rules about who can fly business class and who can't and when should you and when shouldn't you. You know, so maybe you set a simple rule, any flight longer than eight hours, you can fly business class. But what if it's seven hours and 45 minutes and I've got a really important meeting in the morning? Okay, maybe we can make an exception for that. But what if it's cheaper to fly business class and if it's, if it's not? Okay, we'll make an exception. If it's cheaper, then you can fly. And the more you begin to create rules, the more rules you need. The more you begin to differ on what is the boundary, what is good and what is bad, the more you have to establish more policies about how do we make sure everybody's on the same page. And the more we establish policies, the less we're on the same page. And unfortunately, the reason those lights in my mirror cause me to fear it's because even if I'm probably following the law, I know there are times I don't. Like I've got a lead foot. I do use a blinker. I, I assure you of that most of the time. 
But I have a lead foot, and, and sometimes I don't have plates on my car because I haven't gotten there yet, and, and all kinds of other problems, right? So when I see those lights, I'm immediately afraid because it's definitely possible that I was doing something I shouldn't. The law functions like that mirror for us. Whether it's the law about what is good or bad sexually, whether it's the law about what is good or bad when it comes to coveting your neighbor's stuff and taking their stuff, whether it's the law about murdering or anger, whatever those laws are, it shows us just how broken we are. Now, I have to be careful here, and I'm going to give a caveat. This function of the law doesn't really work in this world. Here's what I mean. The function to show us where we stand before God, this world's laws can never show us that. There's not a single country that can write laws to determine whether or not you are in God's kingdom or out of it. They can never determine your actions are against God's kingdom or not. Only God can do that. And only his church can do that. Because he's given that authority to his church. Next week, we're going to talk about the church and the government, the church and state, the church and culture, and how they interact. But for now, just know this. This second use or function of the law only exists in the context of faith. So if you have somebody who doesn't believe in God, and you want to just prove to them how broken and sinful and messed up they are, it's not going to work. They need something different. But if you have somebody who loves God, who's filled with faith, who thinks they're perfect, maybe it's good to show them just how imperfect they really are. Then there's this third function of the law, this way the law works in this world. This third function is what I call the conforming function. There's a certain standard that we have all agreed is good for society. A certain standard by which we think people should seek to measure up. A ruler, we say, this is what is good and bad. Like, consider this. We would all agree that you're not a very kind person if every time somebody says or does something you don't like, you flip them the bird and call them names. You might be a kind person in other areas of your life, but in that one area, you're kind of a jerk. What if you're really greedy and you intentionally cheat and steal and try to take from others so that you can have more? Is that good for our society? Well, no. If everybody operates with their own self-interest as the primary thing, we're going to find ourselves doing a lot of harmful things to others. And so it's good for law to be established to say this is the standard by which we all think we should agree, or at least we should abide even if we don't agree. Now this is one place where the church has often tried to use their influence on the government to force the world around us to look like us. The, the church has often in history used this, this function of the law to say, well, you have to believe like I believe, and therefore you have to do what I do. But that's not what it's there for. You see, this function of the law is not so that everybody conforms to our faith, but so that society conforms to the standard society has decided is good. And I, I specify the difference there. Because you and I, as people of God, should have a standard that is different from this world. We should have a measure of what good life looks like that looks different from what non-Christians around us look like. So if what you're trying to do in your voting and your determination of, of what's good and what's bad is force others to think and act like you, even if they don't hold the same faith as you, you're missing the point altogether. And we'll talk about this as well in weeks to come, the power of influence and how we go about changing the world when we don't like what we see. But this function of the law to conform 
it's good for us to say, you know, I really don't think men should walk around without any pants on. Like, you should have something covering up your, your, your hind region, right? That just seems good for all of us. You don't want to drive down the road and see a whole bunch of men just flashing you all the time, do you? I don't. If you do, we should talk. But these conforming standards help us shape what's good for us. And there is a measure of morality comes into this. Like if you think it's fundamentally evil for men to be flashing people, well then you should make sure that men can't go around flashing people. And when people are really uncomfortable with the idea of regulating morality in any capacity from the law, know that we already do this. Like, if you get mad at somebody and choose to kill them, we already call that intentional murder, not accidental. And we already separate and say intentionally murdering somebody is different on a moral standard than accidentally murdering somebody. Like, we already do that. And so it's okay for some measure of morality to shape the laws that you think should be passed or the things that you think are just. It's not okay is for you to believe everybody has to live at the standard of a Christian without being a Christian. In fact, in America, Christians are really good at saying, this is how everybody should live. Do as I say and not as I do. Right? We want to make laws that change other people without actually looking in the mirror to see just how much we are breaking that law ourselves. It's not good. The law functions then to conform us so we know what's a healthy measure we should strive for. We'll flip ahead in Romans a little bit to Romans chapter 7. Paul, he continues with this whole argument about the law and the purpose of the law. And then he says this, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. You see, he says, just before, he says, look, the law only shows us just how broken we are. Every single one of us, every time we look at the law, should see, I don't measure up. I don't meet the standard that I should live by. I don't stay within the boundaries of what's healthy and unhealthy. So should we just discard the law and say it's evil and avoid it and, and go for a lawless society? No. By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For what I would not have known, or for I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Paul, he spells out this picture that the more we see the law, the more it makes us want to do the very thing we shouldn't do. And you guys probably know this, right? Were any of you teenagers at one point? The very moment a rule is set in front of you, you want to break it. Not because you disagree with the rule, but because you don't want to be told what to do, right? That's just the way it is with God's law and with most of the laws of man. If there's something we're told we can't do, we feel offended. Or even worse, if there's something we're told we have to do, you can't tell me what I have to do. Take a look at what happened in Michigan just this week. Thirteen men who believed the government was overstepping their bounds by telling them they had to wear a mask decided it was better to try and kidnap the governor. What? Like, very few cultures in the world is that ever considered better to kidnap somebody. But for them, they perceived being told what they were supposed to do was worse than breaking this law. The very moment we are told law, we're convicted of our sin because sin seizes an opportunity the truth of the matter is, ever since Genesis chapter 3, all that was good and perfect was broken. And you and I are broken, sinful people. Our natural desire is to do the very thing the law forbids. Every one of us. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. 
The very commandment that promised life proved to be the death of, to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. A little bit of history about a guy named Martin Luther. If you're not familiar with him, Martin Luther, he was a, a priest and a pastor in uh, the 1500s. And Martin Luther, he was the worst kind of guy. Like, he will tell you himself, well, not anymore, it's 500 years ago, he can't tell you now, but he would have told you himself then, he was the worst kind of guy. In fact, all the other pastors around him hated him, for one reason in particular. Every time he came in for confession, he would spend hours and hours and hours confessing. And he'd confess, like, I confessed that six weeks ago I confessed a sin that I didn't really actually mean, and I wasn't really sorry, but now I'm sorry. Forgive me for not really being sorry when I said I was sorry. Nobody cares. Be forgiven and move on. Oh, and I confess that I don't actually love my neighbor and I really hate them. Okay, be forgiven and move on. And he would just obsess about his guilt and his shame, and all the ways he'd broken the law, and all the ways he didn't measure up, and all the ways he wasn't enough. You ever felt like him? I want to do what is right, but I keep doing what's wrong. I want to be a different kind of person, but every time my kids drive me nuts, I continue to raise my voice. Paul, he continues here in verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. He says, if I'm doing the thing I shouldn't do, I'm agreeing that the law says don't do that and it's not good to do. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He continues then in verse 24 with this. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. See, you and I cannot do it. We will not do it. The law, whether it's the law of man or the law of God, will always show you and I to be inadequate, unable to measure up, unable to stay perfectly within those bounds. And so you and I need to turn to Jesus, say, you alone are the one who gives me hope and strength and comfort to love the things that are good and seek to avoid that which is bad. And we don't need to force the world around us to turn to Jesus. We just need to be the ones who actually do it. Let me turn to Jesus, and when a law is broken and unjust, I'm going to work to fix that. When a law is evil and the boundaries aren't healthy, I'm going to work to help that. Not to regulate morality and and force people to be like me, but so that justice and peace can be preserved in this world. As I said last week, I'll say it again, God does not need you to follow the law at all. But your neighbor does. Your neighbor needs you to care about the law and to love. See, the law gives us a content, a context for which we're to love our neighbor. If we have this context, we know these are ways that today I can love my neighbor. These are ways that today I can serve somebody else. These are ways that today I can make a difference. For someone else. Thanks be to Jesus that when we fail, he won't. Amen. We're going to do something now that we usually do before the service, or at least earlier in the service. But I think it's really helpful to do at this point. You see, when we talk about the law, 
we all break it. And when we talk about politics, we often twist the law to be our agenda, what we think it should be, and not something that's serving peace and justice. We often try to regulate what other people act like without acting like the very things we're trying to encourage them to be. We often neglect the law and say, it doesn't really matter if I speed or if I jaywalk or if I litter. It's really trivial, isn't it? So in the church, when we gather, we do this very thing that Martin Luther would do so often. We confess our sins. That God, I have broken the law today in many ways. Not only the law of man in ways that are probably seemingly insignificant, but I've certainly broken your laws, the things that you have called me to do. And so we confess our sin. And the Bible has promised that when we confess, he is faithful and just and will forgive us all of your sin. So will you join me in this prayer of confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Unlike Martin Luther, who so often felt condemned and ashamed and embarrassed by the things he had done wrong, receive this very promise he's spoken for you. By the power of Christ and what he has done on the cross, thanks be to God as a called and ordained servant on his behalf. I forgive you all of your sins. You are forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.